title implies that our God is a God for people with broken hearts. And I know that every person who is here today and every person who joins us through the television congregation has a broken heart. Our hearts are broken by personal concerns. All of us are carrying the wound of grief for someone or many people whom we have loved and who now have died. We bear the wounds and the grief of sickness. We bear the wounds and the sorrow of disappointment and failure in life. All of our hearts are broken. And I want you to know that God cares deeply for you and feels your hurt and pain and reaches out to strengthen and heal your broken heart. Our hearts are also broken by our participation in and our feeling for the sadness and the grief of the world all around us. When we watch the evening news, our hearts break over and over again, recently perhaps for the news story of the father in Syria, listening to the crying sound of his children as they died beneath the rubble of their bombed out home and there was nothing he could do. Or the sight of the mother in South Sudan weeping for food and water for her children. I think a story that touched me and broke my heart in particular this week was listening to CBC Radio, an interview with an indigenous man in tears, recounting his experience in residential schools. In particular, the story of how when he was five and his brother was six years old, they would still climb into bed with their mom and dad. And it was such a beautiful family unit filled with warmth and love. Until one morning, the government showed up and took those little boys away, a thousand kilometers away from their mom and dad. And they did not see their parents again for seven years. And when they finally did, everything was changed. And they could not go back. Our hearts are broken again and again for the sadness and the grief in the world. And so often the things that break our hearts are events brought about by the cruelty of one human being or a group of human beings against another. You will note this week when you receive your letter about the Easter fundraiser that the theme of the fundraiser is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ we can overcome the cruelty of the world. And we do that. Every time when in mission we reach out to someone who is hurt or hungry or thirsty or broken, by the power of the resurrected Savior, we change the world and we overcome its cruelty. The story in John 11 today is a story of two different worlds. It's a story of broken hearts and healing hearts, a story of wonder and goodness overcoming the darkness of the world. In a little town called Bethany, just a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem, there is a wonderful family. Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And their home is an open home where everyone is welcomed. Sinful people and sick people and hungry people and broken people, they are all received there. And in that little home in Bethany, and in fact in that whole small community, Everyone was loved and cared for. That's the place where Jesus would live for the last week of his earthly life. When he came close to Jerusalem, he needed a place to stay. And he went to the house of Mary and Martha. And every morning, he would wake up in Bethany. And he would walk the couple of miles into Jerusalem to the temple. And every night, he would walk home again. 
And the two worlds were very, very different. Then a sad thing happened in Bethany. The brother of Mary and Martha died. Lazarus, whom they loved and whom Jesus loved and whom the whole community loved. So Jesus went back to meet with Mary and Martha. Now, there's lots of details to this story, uh, lots of interesting factors that all have a significance and a meaning. I'm not going to deal with all the little details today, why it is that Jesus waited a couple of days before going, uh, why it is that Mary and Martha were perhaps angry with Jesus and both greeted Him saying, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. Or the beautiful verse in which Jesus, moved by his own broken heart, wept. Or that strange verse where Jesus wanted to roll the stone away, and Martha, who was ever practical, said to him, Don't roll the stone away. He's been dead for four days, and he stinketh. Sometimes the King James Version really gets it. <laughs> Only one point in the story today that I want to share with you, and that is the fact that whatever happened leading up to it, Jesus stood in front of the open tomb after the stone was rolled away, and in a loud voice he said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus was risen from the dead. And Lazarus walked out and Jesus said, take off of him the funeral wrappings and let him live. I wish it could be so for every grieving person here, that we could see resurrection so immediate and so clear. I wish it could be so. But then again, what Christ offers is more than just that. We have to keep in mind that at some point in the future, Lazarus would have to die again. Jesus couldn't keep bringing him back. But what the story is about is the fact that ultimately, Lazarus was raised from death to life eternal by the power of Christ's resurrection, just as all of you are raised from death in the power of Christ's resurrection, and Christ offers that power and that wonder and that goodness to the whole world. It's a foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is only a few days away from this event in Bethany, in which Jesus says, you shall live. You shall live in God's love and you shall all live forever. That story in John 11 is the story of two worlds. The world of Bethany, where Jesus was loved and accepted, where all the people who were outcast and poor and sinners, those who were weak and sick and hungry and thirsty, were beloved and received with warmth and love and goodness. It's the story of Bethany, of love, and broken hearts, and healing hearts. And then on the other side, it's the story of Jerusalem, where Jesus goes in John chapter 10 and John chapter 12, but it's a very different story there, not a story of love and acceptance and goodness and grace and warm hearts. Jesus goes into Jerusalem and he offers the gift of love to the people in the church there, and they shouted at him, saying, you are a blasphemer. And he offered them love, and they turned away from him with cold and hard hearts. And Jesus said to them, my sheep hear my voice, and they listen to me, and I give them eternal life and they shall never die. And in Jerusalem they said, blasphemer. 
And when he spoke the words of eternal life, they picked up stones and they began to stone him with the intention of killing him. And later in chapter 11, they try to kill him again. And in chapter 12, when they have heard about the resurrection of Lazarus, they plan and plot to kill Lazarus. What was so offensive? What was so hurtful and so wrong about the message of Jesus that they would try to stone him to death just because he wanted to heal broken hearts and lift up sad and crushed people? Why was it so offensive to hear the news that God loves sinners that God loves people with broken hearts, that God loves the grieving and the sick and those who have failed. It's a story of two worlds. The world of Bethany filled with tenderness and warmth and the world of Jerusalem filled with bitterness and anger. Where do you live? Do you live in Bethany? I pray that you do. I pray that you live in that place that is so beautiful that it is a place of healing. It's difficult to live in Bethany because it means that you have to associate with outcasts. You have to associate with people whom society pushes aside because they're bre- b- broken or weak or sick or poor. There is a difficulty in living in Bethany. Living in Jerusalem is so much more attractive because that's the place where the powerful people are and the rich people and the healthy people and the normal people. And so often in this life when we have to make the choice, do we live in Bethany or do we live in Jerusalem, we choose to live in Jerusalem because it is easier and on the surface it is so much more attractive because it is filled with worldly power and worldly promise. So why would you ever choose Bethany? Well, something happened in Bethany. And what happened in Bethany was this. The Savior of the world stood before an open tomb and cried out to a man who had been dead for four days and said, Lazarus, come out. It is the place of resurrection, of new life of broken hearts healed and made eternal for Lazarus and for you. It is the place of new life in Jesus, the new life which cannot be seen and doesn't add up to anything in the estimation of the world because it is not physical or visible. But for those who want it, it is there and available. It's the source of the healing of your broken heart. Your personal broken heart for the grief of those whom you have loved so much. It is also the place for the healing of the hearts that are broken by the sadness and sorrow of the world around us. All of that brokenness created by human cruelty. The brokenness of those who are sick and hungry and thirsty displaced by war, broken by violence. And our hearts are healed when we care for them. And when we do that, we are new people. We are already resurrected people, alive in the resurrected Christ. Eternal life has begun for us, and we are already living in the kingdom. When we connect and we give with grace and wonder and care and goodness. We are not people who need to guard our personal power or our worldly wealth. We give it all away because we have put our hope 
and our future into the heart of that man who lived in Bethany for the week before he went to the cross. And with full confidence, we know that if we live in him, we shall live in eternity with him. Because he has said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They shall never die. I give them eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.